185milesouth.com. Smash that Patreon button. One hundred and eighty five miles south, a hardcore punk rock podcast. What's up, everyone? We are back and talking hardcore, helping out. You know him. You love him. It is the best dressed man on the pod. It is Daniel Sant. What's up, Dan? Talk for hours, you hardly know you. <laughs> I'll help it out. Uh, from High Viz, it is Graham Sale. What's up, Graham? What's happening? I'm good. Thanks for having me. So this is airing on October 21st. Your LP, Guided Tour, just came out on October 18th on Deus Records. Uh, the same night that you played San Diego. Great show. Uh, my stage dive was epic. I didn't hurt anyone, and I didn't kill myself, so that was awesome. <laughs> Um, Dan, thank you for catching me. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it took a lot, but you know, <laughs> I had to put you on these shoulders. Standing on the shoulders of giants. That's right. Dan has been carrying me for decades. So like this was not out of the ordinary. Um, <laughs> Dan, let's jump right into it. Uh, we got this record early and you have been jamming it nonstop as have I, but like, High Viz falls more into your wheelhouse than me, especially like the newer stuff. Like you, you get like the influences more than me. So jump right into it. Yeah. So this record is uh, quite an achievement. It's absolutely amazing. I love um, it starting with like the the little sound, well, sound effects or the live recording or whatever of like the car. But then later in the record, you've got the, uh, the tube like sound that's I don't know that's really cool but um what I what I found on this LP compared to compared to the first record and compared to blending is there seems to be like even like so much more depth musically like there's so much going on in the songs like so much layering of of the riffs where um especially on the first record it would be pretty sparse but in a in a brilliant way but this is like just such a uh i would say a you know a different depth to it um production wise like basically what what did you go into this thinking and trying to achieve and and how do you feel like it came off um first of all thanks that's nice uh, and I don't know, really. We we spent ages doing it. It's been like ever since ever since we finished blending. We just were like I mean, guided tour was written probably like around the time blending was getting recorded um, as a song. I mean, and like we've just been we've just been kind of like building the album over over the over the time since blending came out. Really, so it's like. And we like, and I was, I was chatting to someone yesterday about it, and like the way that we write or whatever is, um, it's ba- it's more like it's more in line with like a bedroom producer or something, in that like everything gets recorded. We get demos at Ski's house basically, so we kind of build the songs around that. So there's always kind of like a layer of like adding bits on top and adding bits on top and being like, oh, like Martin will be like, oh, it'd be cool to put an extra bit on this or like make a you know have a little chorusy guitar part over here so it all just kind of get like it gets built on top of each other really and then the same thing sort of happens in the studio it's not like it's not like back in the day where we just go and practice in a uh in a practice space and just go sort of jam as much so i think yeah i think just maybe the way of writing it has probably influenced that and also we're just kind of like fucking around with loads of different sounds um and kind of feeling quite free with it really yeah so like um the way a high viz song comes together these these days is kind of like is ski kind of like the architect of of most of the music yeah um, 
basic like parts and then you'll kind of give it a direction and then martin will come in and like really you know put all the flourishes and all the guitar parts like to that kind of bring it to life yeah definitely it's like it's it, it's such a like a mad process because like martin's really good at writing like vocal patterns and stuff i just i kind of just turn up and just go yeah like that that's good or do that do that a bit more or whatever but like it's like it's yeah it's it's like i don't really know how to explain it to be honest because everything everything gets demos so we had like you know the whole album demo but with like programmed drums and with some of the songs that we'd never played we we'd hardly even practice we didn't have time to like go to the practice space and like practice them because obviously they change as soon as you start doing that as well um but yes so ski ba- yeah ski basically right i think i guess i guess most uh, yeah probably all of the album he'll have like he's you know he's, he's had a massive part in writing and then martin comes along and like rob hamron comes along and like his parts is he writes those like really cool sort of little guitar parts that like you know the kind of chorusy like comedian sound and stuff he's really good at add, add, adding little bits to stuff as well <clears throat> so like everyone's everyone plays kind of like a part in it do you know what i mean yeah graham can you compare that a bit like in the beginning when you would jam in the practice space more how do you find a balance um between getting in a room and jamming stuff out together versus demoing remote and do you feel like something can be lost in like the remote writing or do you think that it's beneficial to bands like in this time i don't do you know what it's it, it's a weird thing because it? it's like it it's just the way i guess it's the way skis always worked so it's kind of I, I like I you know I love going to the practice space. I also love going to the practice space with the demos and them completely changing. Like that song, I know it's not on this album or anything, but "Forgot to Grow" was like was a song that me and Ski were like fucking around with. And he he wrote it, and then I was like, I want to write a guitar part. So I just, I can't play guitar. Like I, I like literally literally can't play guitar. And I just played some fucking like Poundland Mad Bull riff, and then he like. Then it kind of he took that and then he played that again and it was like it's just all like it's constantly like evolving to the point where and then we went to the, you know we went to the practice space and started practicing it and then it completely changed again and then we went to the studio and then the song just became I don't know what it is but it like you know what I mean it's just it's, it's always changing until until we get and actually record it there's no like set um, outline for how it's going to sound and and was this um... Was it then once you get in the studio? Was it then like even transformed further? Like when you work with Jonah? Yeah, hundred percent. Especially because like I, you, you you go in with like as much of an idea as you can about how things are gonna sound and be. I think ski like this like ski was really quite um, particular about how certain things sounded this time, and it, I think it came off cool, you know. Uh, but we, we often go in there, Jonah, because like. Jonah's like a proper little cheerleader, you know, and like all of us, well, especially, well, I say all of us, I'll speak for myself. Like, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. So when he, he, he'll he like lead me in a way and be like, oh, no, I have a go at this or like maybe try and do that in tune or whatever, you know, like, it, it, I'm always, like, I'm all, like, always willing to uh, sort of listen to other people and just try things out because, you know what I mean? I don't really, I'm not like this is how it's going to be. I'm going to sing it like this. Yeah. So for the uh, for everyone listening, and if people don't understand, I uh, mean Jonah Falco, the uh, drummer from Fucked Up, is the producer of the last. Uh, is it all three Ivis records? Uh, just LG? just the, just the last two. Um, the last two. Yeah, yeah. He um, kind of like both. Yeah. Because that's, I mean, what's, you know, I mean, what's a producer? I don't, I don't really know what a producer was, but it's basically just having a mate there who's like really encouraging and just knows music. Because he's like, Jonah's like so talented. I mean, maybe talented is the wrong word, isn't it? That, uh, but like, he, he's just, he's such a like skilled musician in every way. He can, he can play anything, you know, like, and knows us and knows like, knows sort of what we're, I guess, yeah, I don't know what we're into. Yeah, he he understands the reference points. He understands what you're going for because, yeah. I mean, like, produce the chisel understands what they want to 
achieve and understand, yeah. you know, Chubby and the Gang, etc. And like each band sounds very different from everybody else, but he hones into what you want to do and just helps you. Yeah. He doesn't force it in a way. Which the thing, that's the thing, like, <clears throat> you know, with, with, with a lot of that stuff, he's very good at, like, making stuff sound like a punk record. But he's also just, like, you know, he's not uh, he's not one of those, like, closed box sort of, like, no, it has to sound like this if it's going to be a punk record, otherwise it's just something else. You know what I mean? He's, he's open to trying shit. Yeah. So, like, going into this, were there um, certain songs that, you were trying to, um, cause I've not fully had the chance to, you know, I haven't got the lyric sheet in front of me yet. I'm still waiting uh, for my record to arrive, but from listening to it, like I can definitely pick up on a, a lot of, um, basically anger at the state of society. Yeah. On, on a few of the songs and obviously guided tour is kind of, it it seems like it's uh, saying, you know, people want to, for lack of a better term, like slum it with the working class and then just turn their back type thing. And it it's yeah, that's uh, some of us can't leave this world, you know. That's uh, that's definitely like I think that that like I was thinking about that a lot with, you know, I've got a lot of friends in like creative industries and whatnot, and working in advertising or whatever. And there's, there's something about people adopting. Well, fetishizing the aesthetic or idea of of something, be it like you know subculture or class or whatever, and uh, they want to sort of like eat from it or um, you know benefit from it without any sort of like any respect or care or to to the people involved and what you know or like all the graft that people put into store for you know that <clears throat> it's basically just it's benefiting from something without any of the risk or without any of the uh, yeah. Yeah, go on. So, yeah, no, I, I, I definitely see that you know happening all the time because even just in in your um, in your own aspects, like people, I mean, but it's been the sickest things where like CP company has like hit you up to be part of of their like uh, quarterly magazine or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's amazing because that's stuff that you already wore anyway. So. Yeah, yeah. But it's I'm not saying like they're fetishizing it, but there is so much of that going on. And then um is there anything that like thematically for the entire LP that you were trying to get across or is each song kind of like a different thought process or is there a, a general theme throughout the uh LP that you think is the overarching like lyrical theme of what you were trying to get across i don't think i don't no i definitely wasn't trying to like do it it's, it's not coherent i mean each, each song is like it, it, I, I can like directly relate it to like a moment in the past couple of years or something because like you know i'm not I'm, i wasn't really like writing them as songs necessarily they're mostly just like voice notes or notes on my phone that like become songs after like either something's happened or just been thinking about something along those lines and like and uh, you know, so much has happened in the past two years in my life that I, like kind of had a lot to write about, and I, I can only really, I'm like I'm not really smart enough to write from any other perspective really. So I just write from my own, and like, uh, I guess just yeah, change like changing my life up quite a lot over the past two years has had a given me lots to write about. <laughs> yeah, Graham, are, are you referring to your sobriety? Uh, it's to do, yeah, that, and then like I also like I got married, and like I met someone. Um, well, I met maybe I guess most people in hardcore know her. Um, and got married, and like just there was like a period where I was like, I'd broken up with my girlfriends who like, you know, I think I still think sick. She's like she's an amazing person. It just was like one of those things where you do the di- really difficult thing because you know that it feels like the right thing, but then you I spent like a year just sitting in my house on my own pretty much after like blowing my whole life up um to because I fell in love but I was also like fell in love with someone who lived across the world and I'd see like twice a year or whatever so it's like quite a mad time um I mean sort of like you know overshare or whatever but like I was 
all my so like a lot of my social circle was like intertwined with my my ex and I was uh just kind of sat on my own. Yeah, basically just stuck with my own thoughts for a while. So it was like quite difficult, that weird lonely time for a while. Yeah, all the while while doing a band that is ramping up like crazy at the same time, I bet was Yeah, and trying to juggle that and and living <clears throat> and working and whatnot. Because I mean that like the, the past couple of years have been it's like when I when I deep it now, I mean I've like I've I quit my job in it in school, so I'm like I've got that added stress, but also <laughs> and freedom and stress. But like last year I was like going on tour and I'd finish work on a Friday, I'd go on tour for three weeks straight, get back on a Sunday, and then go back into work on Monday. And then, you know, if I'm in work I'd be like, Oh, you know, how was your break and all that? And I'm like, Well, yeah, 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 it was fine, yeah. And I, you know, I wouldn't really be able to be that. I've just fucking travelled everywhere. So I'm sort of like trying to keep that side of my life separate as well. Graham, in, in the in that time, like the the two years when you were struggling a little bit uh, mentally with, you know, your partner being so far away and stuff, did did you struggle with your sobriety at all? Because uh, I, I can relate to this a little bit. We we both got sober kind of later in our punk lives. Yeah, you're you're at a few years. I'm at like two. Yeah, um, but it's a it's a very wild change. Yeah, especially with coping with things. Yeah, I definitely I've like I've slipped and stuff. Times I've had like I do I'm basically just doing my best, but it's like been yeah, it was hard. There was time like there's times in it where I've like slipped and stuff like that, and then sort of like I feel back on track and stuff now. But it's it's like it's not uh it's not cut and dry. I don't think this stuff. And um, do you know, every, I, I I don't have like a a community around me of like sober people necessarily like everyone around me is i live in london do you know what i mean everyone's everyone's a record so it's like <laughs> i'm trying, trying to uh trying to sort of yeah stay just like happy with myself as well do you know what i mean like that's the thing you got to do it for yourself in it and do yeah 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 how do how does it play with your creativity musically um have you have you been able to maintain like your creativity with like drinking less i think it's like you, there's a certain um you, like it takes the edge of things sometimes and maybe like frees you up to talk about things a little bit more if you are like not sober but i, I don't know yet I, I remember like speaking to my therapist about that and he was just like you need to trust that you've got the um, you've got that thing inside you. You don't need to unlock it using drink or drugs or whatever. And I always kind of keep that in mind, really. So I think it's it's probably, hard, I guess, harder. I mean, you know, everyone else in the band drinks and whatever. So it's, I don't know. Maybe they're the creative ones. I just have to. I just have to be the stressed, fucking tense one. Who, trying to make sense of things <laughs> yeah yeah I, i'm sorry for diving that in but i mean oh, no, it, is, it is interesting when i see people like take that turn like later it's, yeah it's commendable dude because it's fucking hard yeah it's yeah it's um yeah it still is i think sometimes it gets it gets easier but you just gotta find other things to distract yourself in it um yeah well luckily you have a band yeah that's the thing i know mean, i'm going on tour for fucking forever now so <laughs> yeah yeah this album compared to the last one to me it's almost more of a vibe the last one had some really big singles and this one to me is more of a like a vibe it's like you're you're stabbing at some things there's a lot of like droney guitar and there's like a a lot of like big feelings throughout it D- do you think that i'm off base on that uh no i definitely i mean I, I think it like although it wasn't you know built to be like a coherent like here is the album we're writing an album it starts like this you know it's like built around stuff but i think everything sort of tied in there's like well we tried to t- tie things in and i guess it's like um we just tried to like push it a bit further i guess uh, really what we're doing because you know try like it doesn't necessarily fall into any genre does it it's like, like it's kind of there's a there's like a lot i know there's a lot going on in it but uh yeah, I don't 
Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, I guess, yeah, that's it. You're right. But uh, I don't know how to say it, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm with you. Well, well was there, like, was there a, a lot more songs that were up for it and then you, like, whittled it down to these are the ones that are in the LP? Yeah, definitely. We had, like, I mean, we overwrote a lot. We had, like, I don't know, maybe 18 songs, maybe, or something. But, like, there's stuff, I mean, I'm sure I've sent you demos in it. And probably like of stuff that like along the way it was going to go on, but we just ended up like uh shelving. And then there's t- there's like there was two songs that oh actually just maybe think that's a good shout. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> and it's funny I'm just talking to myself here, but uh, it's a... we basically had two other songs that we recorded on it which didn't we couldn't finish in time basically for the album. We want and I feel like. I'm kind of I'm glad that we didn't put them on because it was one of my favourite songs on it, um, and I just couldn't get the vocals right. I couldn't work it out. The demos that we did, it sounded cool. Then when we was in the studio, it just kind of like seemed to lose its life. I think. So um, yes, yeah, so we've got we've got them recorded and kind of ready to go. Just going to go do the vocals on them. I wanted to talk about the sequencing of the record a bit because. In modern music and punk and hardcore or whatever, whatever the fuck we're doing, um, like now we put out singles first, like digitally. And the singles that you chose for this record, I don't know if they were representative of the record. So like the Mob DLA song was kind of like an alt rock song. And then Mind's a Lie is like an electro dance song. Yeah. So that's pretty crazy. A, it was a brave move, right? And it yeah. pulled off really well, but but not representative of the record. And then when we got the record, it was like, okay, here we go. Like out the gate, guided tour. Here's the jingle jangle we want, right? And then right after that, drop me out. Okay, now we're kicking ass again. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. can you talk a little bit about how you're trying to lay out a record and and how you decide to represent the record before it comes out with the singles? I think that's the thing that we... I definitely didn't think about the singles being representative of the record. I felt like as a sort of, I, I think Mob DLA came out at a time, I thought because of the state of the country, the elections were coming up and I was like, and that song was like very specifically about the state of um, the way that, the way that uh, society treats people who are most vulnerable, essentially. Uh, and I was thinking a lot about my brother and whatever, and it was just it felt like it felt like the right song to put out at the right time in the, it in the landscape the UK, you know, the British landscape, whatever. That was that was it. It wasn't necessarily to like to be like, oh yeah, we're back or whatever. But also, like as a song, I fucking love that song because it's just like it's super hard. And also, who what did it like? Trying to think of what Jonah called it, he always makes like good puns about like I don't like my bloody ice men or something. It was like, <laughs> it's, which which had like it was kind of like this yeah super stompy like New York hardcore sounding part with like shoegazy bits. But uh, yeah, it, it it's weird. It has it has like a total like definite like homotype. District ninety part that yeah. meets like shoegaze yeah. and shoegaze shoegaze with a backpack on Timberland gazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, go on, I'm just interrupting it. I mean, Zach, Zach and I have been messaging back and forth uh, as the the first two singles came out, and you know, his like hope was like the the third one right before the record comes out will be the the um the jangle that he he was just like cringing from. But then as soon as the record, the actual LP starts, you got guided tour and it's just, it is the most like Manchester 89 jangle on guitar. That is just unbelievable. Like, <laughs> it's full on North side. Like, but then, but then the song progresses. Like it initially gives you that, like, absolute Manchester vibes and then it just goes into like pure high vis like as the song like hits the second part of it yeah well dan just on guided tour the the thing that i think is interesting about that one is like the the final musical sequence i don't have as good of points of reference as dan with like the manchester stuff or brit pop 
But like that final sequence reminds me of when I worked at Starbucks when I was like 18 or 19, you know, I used to stay up and drink till like two in the morning and then go to sleep. And then I'd go to Starbucks like to work at 5 a.m. And so every afternoon I'd take a nap. And what I would go to sleep to is side A of the Joshua tree. And like, <laughs> like th- those, like those like long drawn out, like musical parts on there are so nice. Like people hate on you too, but like they're playing. Cause like that album is the shit. Mm-hmm. And like that final s- like sequence on this before your vocals come back in reminds me so much of that. Dan, do you think I'm tripping or what? No, I can, I can see what you say. It's like what, what that does and what, the edge does as a guitar player is like very defined, like standing above the rest of the music. And I think the guitars are playing off each other so well, like in that part that it, you know, there is that kind of perhaps vibe. Martin is Irish. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that's that's true. (laughs) That's true. Yeah. Okay. And then when guided tour wraps up, we go to one of the rockers off the record. Drop me out. This song brings the heat. What do you think? I I love the song. Like it's kind of like I was yeah, been excited to play that. We played it a couple of times, and it's like yeah, it felt like it feels like singing a hardcore tune, you know? Yeah, that one and Gone Forever both rip, and and that's kind of an interesting spot too with the sequencing to in the record with the Ripper. Yeah, I, I that was those two. So Minds of Lion and, and uh, Gone Forever kind of went hand in hand in my eyes like we i wanted to do like a long video for both of them and uh we just couldn't make it happen in time basically but it's yeah i feel i felt like it was a good way to end it really because i feel you know it is like it's a, it's a it is a, it feels like an angry record i feel i don't feel as like i'm in a particularly like comfortable place when we was doing blending i was like you know i feel like i was doing loads of work on myself or whatever <laughs> lack of you know <laughs> and like now I feel fucking like, a bit on the edge <laughs> well yeah. I think I think you can you can tell that because even on some of the more like some of the music on this that potentially would have been similar to like some of the songs on Blending where you were definitely leaning into this like singing more yeah you're still fucking coming across like aggro as fuck on some of these songs yeah yeah like hopefully instead of like like diving into the pocket and like you know washing over the music like on blending it's like no this is abrasive cutting right through vocally and lyrically um and it's so funny that obviously this is intended but uh you saw gone forever and minds of liars like almost like partners that they needed to be by each other because i love the tiny little reprise of uh minds a lie like in the middle of gone forever like if you listen carefully you can just hear that tiny little reprise of of minds a lie in there yeah i'm glad you noticed that <laughs> yeah, it's so sick yeah cheers it was uh yeah we kind of yeah like i say we just totally planned to put them together and wanted to try and make one long video like a um, and the first one was meant to, like, yeah, I, I kind of, I, like, I'm, I'm so happy with the video and I think it was like trying, I was trying to rope in all my, like, all my mates who were kind of doing video work and whatever now, who would, like, I, I grew up with, you know, and like, especially in my, like, sort of early 20s together and, like, all just being scatty rolling around London. I feel like, yeah, it's, it's not, it feels good. Like, my mate Fraser and, and his partner Martina directed it, and it was like felt pretty. Felt I don't know. It, it feels pretty uh, like accurate about kind of like that, that sort of aimless anger. It it's brilliant because it it gives you like the entire. I mean, I can see why you would want um, Minds of Light and Gone Forever to flow as one giant video because it's it, the Minds of Light is is you know somewhat like an exploration into mental health and where to put energy and and how are you supposed to fix things when your mind you know feels like a lie like when everything feels hopeless and then the gone forever is almost like the 
don't do it when you're gone forever like it, it what can you do you can't come back yeah i was thinking about with the kind of vilification of like the sort of the especially like the working class and like pe- people in this country i see especially recently it's, i see there's one thing i've i've seen a lot of and that's a kind of like um when all the riots kicked off like obviously the, the reason there's i mean there's a plethora of reasons why these things these things happened and like obviously the rise of the right wing over here or people not, not even like the rise of the right wing it's always been there it's like but uh, people feeling like empowered or emblazoned or whatever to be able to act like all of that is the fault of the fucking the media and like government scapegoating and whatever you know like it's and it feels like that song i was sort of i was thinking a lot about uh people you know people get pushed and pushed and pushed and then like obviously when it's over it's over and it's a fucking it is like essentially the fault of fucking the media pushing the narrative in a certain way and like vilifying immigrants or vilifying the working class or vilifying whoever you know but like there's no, there's never any like there's never any responsibility or any like acknowledgement that it is their fault and maybe you know what maybe if we didn't say that it's immigrants coming over here taking your jobs rather than the fact that it's, I've given all the money to my mate you know 100% like I'm a, I mean just look at what's been happening with I mean, the media spinning, you know, that horrible, unfortunate event of, like, those kids getting stabbed and then it becomes empowerment for every fucking dickhead across the country to go and vilify and try and burn down mosques and stuff. Like, it just gave them the green light. They don't believe any of that shit. It's just a chance to be an absolute complete dickhead although some people have been completely hoodwinked by the daily mail but you know it, it's just a disgrace graham how do you feel this record stacks up to your last one and how do you feel about it personally uh i feel kind of, I'm, if i'm honest i'm just quite scared about it all coming out really i'm uh i often like you do the thing and then you might not really realize what's going on. And then I listen back and I'm like, fucking hell, I feel like I completely just exposed myself there. And I thought like, uh, yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm like, I'm excited to get, to get rid of it basically, you know, to like, let it, let it go. And then, but I'm also just, you know, I never did this to, uh, I never did it to get feedback necessarily from it. <laughs> And I, I think it's pretty stupid of me and like ignorant to think that to, to not think about the context of it all really. And that, like people do listen to this band now and it's not just like, it's not just me and my mates doing a thing. Yeah. You didn't want feedback, but welcome to the podcast talking about. Well, I, just, I don't, I don't mind if people are nice. If someone's, I, if somebody, it's a thing. I feel like if you, if people, I like rude about it or people I'll be like I'll just obviously take it personally I'm just like because I feel like it's such an extension of like me you know just an extension of myself and everyone, and all of us really we're all pretty fucking you know I mean I don't really feel like we're in much of a position to be like yeah, yeah. <laughs> well there's there's like there was definitely you know a couple chances taken on on this that were being hinted at maybe by blending and 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 the first one just like the influences but the fact that you went straight up like to do borderline you know like an electronica song like my mind like mine's an eye mine's a lie shit (laughs) but like you you know you, you said that you'd shared some demos with me like ages ago and that was the one that I was like, I can't wait to hear how this one comes out because that one was so exciting for me because, A, I love that kind of music anyway, but to hear your take on it and to do it. And then when I heard the finished version, the way Ski did the drumming on it, yeah, like, oh, my God, unbelievable. And then the um, your friend's vocals are just unbelievable because it starts out like, 
full like house style vocals and then when it when the song transitions in the middle it's full on like cocteau twins yeah, like, yeah. parts like straight up like how how did like was there any kind of nervousness of that being like okay we love this kind of stuff and this is you know we wear these influences on our sleeve but it does this belong uh, it definitely there was but also I felt like when when Ski sent me the first demo and I, he was like, "Oh yeah, it's not really high of his." I was like, "No, it definitely is." I feel like it was. I don't know. It, it felt right. If you know what I mean, like it felt right to do it. Um, but I, I mean, there's definitely was some sort of nervousness around it, but also it's just like, "Fuck it." We've kind of always just done what we want, and I think if you like, if you, it's always good to do the thing that's most feels difficult. You know what I mean? Like, I think in life, that's kind of what I'm trying to do. A lot of the time, is do the difficult thing. If it feel like if it feels like it's the right thing to do, but feels difficult, then you should head in that direction. You know what I mean? Um, absolutely. But yeah, no, I, I mean, I am happy. That a lot of people were like, I say a lot of people. Gibby from Davis was like, "That's fucking sick, do that." But uh, people were like, "Oh, yeah, maybe you should do like a song that." Isn't that? <laughs> As I said, and I was like, "Oh fucking now!" I think it's like if we're gonna like stand our ground and do whatever we want, then let's just do that. Yeah, but now, now everyone's gonna be like, "Can we get three more electronic bangers <laughs> on each LP?" <laughs> yeah, fuck knows how we're gonna what we're gonna go from there. Graham, I appreciate you doing this interview because as you've realized, it's basically just us telling you what we think and then saying, comment, please. <laughs> <laughs> I trust me, I'd rather that than fucking have to think about stuff. I'm like, it's funny, it's funny doing interviews because I'm like, I, you know, I don't, when people are like, oh, is this a, was this the thing you thought about? So I'm like, no, well, it wasn't until today. Do you know what I mean? Like, I'd, a lot of time I haven't sat down and thought about it because I've got an avoided personality, so. <laughs> This style of music is so popular right now, like the hardcore scene and the adjacent things. And, you know, looking at like Sound of Fury and Outbreak Fest, like they're huge. And then also like the sponsorship opportunities. You worked with Taco Bell. Yeah. And how 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 do you like balance that? How do you decide I'm going to work with this one, but not with this one? And and how do you feel about like the corporate sponsorship in punk in general? The way I think about it is, uh, what is the thing I think that is most beneficial whilst uh, sacrificing as little as possible and doing as little as possible? Right? You know, I feel we we like worked with Taco Bell, but we didn't like work with Taco Bell. I made sure to say like, not to, you know, not to slag them off at all. They've like give us free fucking food when we're touring but they just used a song on an advert you know what I mean it wasn't like they weren't like make sure you wear this Taco Bell t-shirt and eat only Taco Bell and tell everyone that Taco Bell's the best like we obviously are like skeptical about doing anything like any kind of advertising or whatever but yeah we basically just decided that that was fine to take money off someone especially because like we never had to mention it i mean <laughs> do you know what i mean i mean i'm men- yeah. I mentioned i'm mentioning it now but uh it's uh I'm, and i'm sure people will uh complain that, about it but i think anyone who if you if you're able to uh to do something and if you're denying that you'd live in a fucking capitalist hellscape then you you're just an idiot to yourself, really. I think trying to like find a way to negotiate that in the way that is compromises your integrity and the you know validity of what you're doing or whatever is the important thing to do. And it's not like you know we're not. I, I don't fuck. None of us want to work for anyone or, or work with anyone, really. You know what I mean? It's not like I always say this. I'm like, you know, brands aren't brands aren't cool or anything. People that like you need to know your worth as a as an artist or as a whatever it is, you know, a member of a subculture or whether you're a fucking you know, skateboarder or a fucking graph writer or whatever it is, you need to know your worth. And um, those people want to work with you. Don't fucking, don't get gassed about it. 
because like brands aren't yeah brands aren't cool people are cool <laughs> yeah but we should specify because you said that you got a bunch of free food you got paid yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get paid oh, no. chalu- chalupas or something. Oh fuck no, no, no. You got no, no. Yeah, okay, exactly. Good. Yeah, yeah. So you, you got you just got you got paid. Uh, you get paid for the usage of the song for like in an advert for however long it is. Um, and like that's it. You know, we've now not not got jobs, and I'm you know I'm not to, I'm not uh, I'm not trying to work with anyone or do anything, but I am going to take money anytime i can because i don't have the fucking financial backing of, <laughs> of anything you know what i mean it's like this is like this is us trying to do the thing so um yeah yeah tonight like i think it's pretty to, especially to judge i'm not like not judging anyone for for doing brand partnerships or whatever i think you've got to do like a certain due diligence on brands and stuff like that and i think in yeah, it's like it's important, but also you just you need to find a way to make this work, innit? If you're gonna do it, and if people want to use a song on a fucking advert, like fair play to them, crack on. But I'm, I'm not gonna sit there and say that I love what you're doing or whatever. I think that there's like an interesting trajectory in your musical career. So in in the year 2008, uh, you were in a band called Dirty Money. You do a split seven inch with Trapped Under Ice, right? Yeah. And so this is kind of a long time ago. And, you know, since then, you know, Trapped Under Ice, they put out the demo, I believe the year before, like people knew it was going to be a thing, but they weren't taking over the world yet. And they did that in the next few years and have turned into one of the most influential hardcore bands in the history of the music. Yeah. Um, you know, whether people want to admit that or not, they're one of the most important bands in hardcore history now. Yeah. yeah. Um, y- you, you do Dirty Money, which is kind of a similar band to that. Um, so kind of on the front wave of it, then you do a band in the early 2010s called Tremors, which is just a totally ripping fast, hardcore band. But it's interesting now that like in the late 2010s and then now in 2024, both you and justice are front men of two of the bigger, like alt hardcore or hardcore adjacent bands. Can you talk about that? Like how you feel about your trajectory and then also, how you feel about like him kind of doing the same thing and like you kind of diverged and came back together. Yeah. It's, I don't know, it's kind of weird, isn't it? I, I, I think about that sometimes. I, I mean, I guess it just goes to show the, we, I don't know. Yeah, what's, what's that? What does it go to show? <laughs> um, that we like doing stuff. I think justice has always been super open-minded and it, <laughs> he's like, he's a fucking freak. I love him. Um, but it's, yeah. I don't know, really. It just it just seems like that you both. I mean, it goes back to what you were saying about minds a lie, like, and exactly what he's doing with Angel Dust is like. No, I'm just gonna create, and if you like it, yeah, good. yeah. It's <laughs> if you don't, you know. He's funny. And he's just like, you know, every time I see him, he looks. Last time he looked like a fucking rhinestone cowboy on the terraces. It was like. Fucking, as if I, he's cool as fuck. He just does his thing, innit? It's like, I think you can't really deny someone who's like, obviously really fucking good at writing music and uh, being pretty like free and loose and just like doing what he wants. you like, yeah, you can't really deny it. Also, I used to, I loved seeing it when T.U.I. started playing shows again. He was like, had his like angel dust outfits on. It's like, his funny little Gallagher hair. <laughs> he was smashing it those people those like those are hard dads from fucking turning up being like what is going on what is this <laughs> <laughs> why is outfits not spin kick this outfit's wrong <laughs> going back to the beginning of high viz what was the original intent and like the mission statement of the band and kind of checking in on that now how do you feel like it's going like the original intent of the band I think, well, I think it's going pretty well. I think, like, I just wanted to, I just said to Ski, I wanted to do something different in it. And he was like, he's always sort of just facilitated fucking having something to do, really. He's like, you know, he's always writing stuff and always, like, been one to push me in a way that is, like, unknown 
or whatever. So I think yeah, we're still kind of doing that. And it still feel you know, it still feels uncomfortable. It doesn't feel like we I guess we've like got a bit of a sound now. Um which is if you listen to like to, you know, this at the start, a lot of the stuff is like kinda of not like not derivative, but like you know, it's we were just like heavily influenced by the comedians and shit like that. And I just didn't really know what I was doing singing wise. Um I think the it's kind of helped us yeah, find the sound through just doing it relentlessly for so long. But I think, I think I don't know, I think we're like just doing what we were doing then, just on a scale that people listen to us now. <laughs> yeah, but what, what's, what's great is it's resonated with so many people because it is a different take and it's also bringing in things that people love in the other side of their record collection, yeah, yeah. but bringing it a hardcore space so i think that's been amazing and then what you've been able to build coming out of this is obviously going on like sick tours which we'll talk about in a minute but like recently you were able to curate an event in uh london that you put together called society exists you want to tell us like about that and like bringing bringing other genres of music in front of these kids or bringing kids that like those genres of music to experience you at the same yeah, time. Really. That was what, that was it really. I just had, had that idea a while ago and I said to Scott Kennedy about it. I was like, I want to do something free in London. How can we make that work? And then um, actually this goes back to the same thing with like uh, doing brand collaborations or whatever, or taking, finding money where you can, uh, you know, when I had that idea, People were like, oh, well, you know, we might have to, maybe like, maybe these people could sponsor it or they could sponsor it. And I was like, no, like, I don't want it to be something like that. It needs to just be for the sake of doing the thing. And yeah, I just wanted to like bring people, like, you know, all my mates that I like partied with and stuff like that in London who are all just doing different things, but feel they're like sonically different, whatever. But we all come from the same culture, really. I just thought it'd be kind of, yeah, cool to, to do a free event in that way. And it, I, I'm fucking so shocked it worked so well. It was a really cool day. But um, yeah, that was it really. Yeah. How, how many people came out? I, I don't know. You know, I, I mean, like a couple thousand, it must have been because it was like, we did like, because we, we put like free tickets on dice. So basically, we how, Scott, yeah. who works for this promotion company, like obviously, it's quite a weird thing being coming from a, punk background and then you know you have to work with booking agents and all this stuff and it's all like above board um but he like he patterned it and they they ended up like helping organize this shit so we had like you know so it was legit so that they could pass it on you know through the council and stuff like that because it was just a free space in dalston and yeah, yeah I've, I've, i mean i don't fuck knows how many people it was a couple of thousand like it must have been and it was a proper like yeah, it was it was sick. It was such a like diverse crowd as well. There's loads of people like because there's lo- that's that square is like really, uh, really infamous. So NTS throw parties there a lot. And it's always you know, and they're always sick. I just thought it'd be good to guitar music. Bit in London especially has been like, you know, for years it was just that kind of like indie, gross Camden thing, which you know like a lot of music of that is, I think is you know I like I like musically. I, a, a lot of stuff that came out of that era but uh it just it didn't feel like my you know didn't feel like it was our lot you know what i mean not like it was kind of kind of yeah. over there um and yeah i don't know just this, this just felt a little bit different yeah for for everyone I, I'm, I'm talking about graham put together an event in a free event in london that had a, a very diverse lineup like hip-hop as well as like electronica plus like high vis ended up headlining it and it it just looked massive uh check out the high vis instagram and go back a, a few weeks and uh look at the pictures they're amazing yeah, cheers it was fun. yeah i was like proper happy how well it went um i want to do more of those sorts of things it's the thing you've got to try like try and find a way to keep it as like organic as possible but obviously these things cost money and the, to, the, to find like you know, I would have loved to have done something in like a big warehouse space that we squatted or whatever, but it's just um 
trying to organize that side of things that you know space is limited and stuff over here so it's kind of next best thing graham at the end of august to the beginning of september you did an australian tour with speed and then also in november of this year you're doing a european run with pain of truth um can you talk about like this kind of goes off of dan's last question with a society exists but um why do you find it important to do mixed bills like this? And do you ever worry about high vis fitting on bills with like the harder bands? Uh, not really. No, I think I, I, I like, I like a mixed bill. I mean, not, not one that's, you know, sometimes people try and force stuff together. And I think that often doesn't really work. You know, if people, if people feel out of place then, and don't feel comfortable in those spaces or whatever, then it just doesn't work. But I think when it, when you get people who are just like, culturally all in the same world or similar world or experience or whatever it just seems to make sense and i like obviously love hardcore shows so uh, it, make, it makes sense to us to like bring out hardcore bands or whatever or go and talk with hardcore bands those those australian shows looked huge what what were your uh main takeaways from that run the speed is like a movement over there and it's it was fucking cool to see um, they were playing like you know it was completely DIY. They got this uh, this girl Candice who like booked the whole tour. Did like such a banging job, and we ended up playing like so. We played a couple of like couple of headline shows with with Speed. This band, uh, pain, uh, this band called Fuse from Singapore, who were fucking wicked, um, and Pain the Truth, obviously. And they were just playing these like enormous fucking theater venues. And a lot of time, you know, if you, if you play those venues with like barriers and stuff like that, it feels pretty rank, and you can't you can't really like like interact with the crowd very well. You can't really tell how things are going. But they were just they were boss. The whole tour was amazing. Um, and just seeing, you know, what seeing the the speed thing happening over there was fucking cool. It was all these like young kids. It's just it feels like you know, just like alternative music to them lot. To, you know, to like to, to the these young kids getting into hardcore, or whatever, and I think it's fucking yeah, it feels like a feels like a movement basically. That's sick. Is it? it is uh, is is speed getting like played on the radio and stuff over there? I, I would have thought so. I don't really. I mean, it seems that in Australia, like uh, guitar music's pretty like culturally dominant. Do you know what I mean? Like it. I, f- I feel like it hasn't been that way, especially in the UK or whatever, for, for a long time. So it, it feels like it doesn't. It doesn't feel. It doesn't feel like a like an other thing over there. So yeah, they must be. They're, they're like they're doing like a lot of like press and seem to be a, like just seem to be everywhere. You know what I mean? The shows were so big. All right, and so now you're in America, and we are going to uh, be really curious about what this set list is going to be like because. How much of the new record? How much of record one, record two? You know, we want all the hits we know. So, you know, <laughs> I can't wait to hear this set list, but, you know, we still need, we still need uh, you know, Walking Wires. We still need uh, Trauma Bonds, etc. Well, we've got to learn the songs. I was letting out to play them first, isn't it? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, um, yeah, I feel like, well, I'll do it. Oh, yeah, I'll do my best. I don't, I, 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 I don't know how I ever can play for fucking an hour. It's quite a long time, isn't it? I've, I've, I've always thought to myself, I don't want to watch a band for longer than like 40 minutes. I mean, you're speaking the gospel to this podcast. We we have a span of 25 minutes only. <laughs> the 25 minutes? I've never played 25 minutes in my life, except when we went to Sweden and they told me we had to play an hour, so we played like 40 minutes. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was rough as a uh, as a fat dude. <laughs> By the way, my request is "Voices" off "No Sense, No Feeling." Oh that yeah, song. Hell yeah! But I don't expect it, dude. You write your own set list. Don't worry about me. Come on. I'll see what I can do. I'll see what I can do. Everyone, High Viz Guided Tour came out on October eighteenth of this year on Deus Records. Dude, buy the thing, or you're a fucking poser. What's wrong with you? Uh, And then also run up those listens on the socials, not on the socials, on the streaming, because that matters. You know, I got this thing on constant rotation, just like the entire catalog. 
It's your choice! All right, we are going to talk the Knuckle Dust full-length Time Won't Heal This. It came out in the year 2000 in the UK on Blackfish, as well as uh, Ruction Records. And then in the United States, it came out on Thorpe Records. Uh, It was a CD-only release. And then in the year 2012, it got that LP blessing. And uh, it is currently in my record collection. This thing was great. Graham, you wanted to talk on this. And I had never dug deep into the Knuckle Dust catalog. It, they have a big catalog. One thing that's sick about this band is they're still around and they're still all original members. So much respect. I didn't really know where to dive into this uh, this catalog. But Dan said that he wanted to talk this. And I've listened to it so many times since. This is a great record, and it really holds up. What do you think about it? Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, Dan has to pick an album, like a, a kind of UK hardcore one. And just like, this was the first thing that jumped out at me, because it was what, the one of the bands that when I first seen them, I was just like, fuck me, this is the coolest thing ever. And just because, like, I've always had to think about the way, obviously, the way things look. Um, and as a band, they just, like, at the time, like, Nicky, the bassist, had a had a mohawk and like you know looked like a skinhead basically. But uh, then Waymer's like seven foot tall and looks like Jay Z. Ray just looks you know like kind of looks like a hardcore kid sort of or slash East Londoner. And Pierre was just like this fucking little ball of energy, like bouncing around. It's one of the hardest, coolest moshers I've ever seen, and like. I, I was just I just loved him ever uh, like ever since the first time I've ever seen him, um, and yeah, just as an album, it's, I feel like it's fucking amazing start to finish. There's no like no skip tracks on it for me. Um, I was like re-listening yesterday. So, I mean, obviously I said this after like not listening to it for like a little bit because I've absolutely rinsed it through my life. But yeah, it still absolutely holds up. It's so sick. It's ten songs, twenty minutes, and the whole thing is hard. And yeah, it. It really does sound modern. You know, if you're into a band now, like Echo Chamber, you would love this. What do you think, Dan? Yeah, the, I mean, when Graham said that he wanted to talk this LP, I'm in my head when he said that, I'm like, how many people has Graham smashed <laughs> in Dust <laughs> Mosh Parts? Like, I mean, I know he's listened to the record, but how many times has he just moshed the shit out of someone to this <laughs> live? Um, and I know that that has definitely happened. It de- I mean, I can, yeah. They're one of the few, like, I mean, they played Wrong Side Fest the other year, and I was like, I don't, you know, I, my body fucking hurts, and throwing your limbs around in a in that manner is fucking puts me out for like weeks. I can't train or do anything. You know, so, but I like I always end up moshing to knuckle dust as soon as you play dust to dust. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's it's essential. The thing about this LP, like it's it comes out like late ninety nine, early two thousand, right? Yeah, and the obviously the the hate breed influence is up front. Like it, you know, it's it's coming out of that world. But like the the record starts with the return of and then into Times Up. Times Up sounds like it is the perfect point in between Path of Resistance and Hate Breed. <laughs> that song sounds like it could be like a split seven inch of them, but both sides are being played at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, like you said, Dust to Dust. Dust to Dust. Two Face Fake and Ill Vision, like those three songs in a row are so fucking hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, yeah. Beat Down is so big right now, and that's cool. And I like some of that stuff. I also like some of the slam stuff, but in general, it's so fucking boring, dude. And this has like some of those beat down parts where like it'll do a big mosh and then they'll slow it down. Um, and it really has some like traditional beat down parts in it, but they keep it so fresh because the base of this band is fast parts. 
Like you can never accuse this band of being anything except for a straight up roots hardcore band. Yeah, it's yeah. so fucking good. So yeah, good. that's the part. I, I, I think there's a lot, a lot of like modern beatdown stuff that here it seems it just lacks the kind of uh, it lacks that groove or or that sort of urgency and like the actual hard part of hardcore. I think and like yeah, this band just it feels so fucking angry and like unhinged, and then they're so good at just playing the most punishing mosh parts. But we're set with a certain bounce and shit to him as well. It's like there's there's a, there's a undeniable thing that a lot of the beatdown bands are missing is the fact that setting up those amazing beatdown parts is coming off of a a fast part or a fast verse into like a you know a hard chorus and then into a beatdown part. But now like a lot of that stuff like just focuses on just trying to get as many moshes into one song yeah, and yeah. it just it doesn't have the yeah the hardcore through lane like to an extent no i was just gonna say there's like a lot of like a lot of the beatdown bands who like i guess was like inspiring or that the knuckle dust always like there's there's kind of like that sort of new york groovy sort of beatdown where it doesn't have that it's still like it's still there's a certain life to it do you know what i mean that's like that just seems to lack in these people trying to outdo outdo each other for like the hardest, slowest beatdown parts. It's still like yeah. it, it feels you know more in line with I don't know like I don't want to say like hip hop or anything, but you know like there's just something else to it. Yeah, like the '90s beatdown, like the One Second Thought or Billy Club Sandwich or Denied, Denied like, or something. Yeah, yeah, the like these bands have a groove. Like there's a groove to it. It's just not a, a lot of modern beatdown is it's like copy pasting mosh parts. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And, and another thing is that this band gets right is the brevity. So there are, there's only one song on here over three minutes and it's really averaging close to two minutes every song. So like that's the move you, you know, you do like a bounce verse or a fast verse and then hit like a big tempo change and then you're out. Yeah. yeah. They don't milk anything. It's, it's so sick, dude. It's so sick. And I love that confidence of writing short songs and not milking parts because it's like, it shows that you're confident that you can always write another, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. These dudes did, they did. They wrote like a shit ton of LPs. So yeah. yeah. So sick. It's all really good. I said, like, yeah. They, Cause they, they did some shit that was like a bit more street punky as they went on. Those was like catchy choruses, but it's all just like really fuck. I mean, like Ray, pay, Ray played in the business for a bit. So they're all like into, do you know what I mean? They're all, they're all punks, essentially. You know what I mean? They're not like, they're, they're all like a lot of different music. So you can uh, kind of like, you can hear the different uh, influences as they sort of, as they progress as a band. I mean, I think Unbreakable, the LP they did after this was fucking amazing. Um, and yeah, it's cool to see. I like, they're still fucking so good live. Still have. Do you think, do you think they've ever truly gotten their due? as being like they are like the you know the legacy like band that has kept uk hardcore going at many points of like downturns where they've been the the one still carrying the torch do you think that they've ever really truly gotten their due i think for that i think they have through i think everyone who who knows knows i mean it's they're like an undeniable band everyone in that I know, you know, even like like Krusty's or whatever, they all like everyone knows them and respects them, especially like through running Ruction and stuff like that. You know, they put stuff out and just all like they've just yeah carried on playing shows the whole time. They never really like take a break or anything like that. So I think yeah, they definitely should be more well known across the pond and stuff like that. I think absolutely, I think they should definitely be a lot more known in America and beyond, but. There's, you know, the time that they started operating was a was a a time where I feel there was some snobbery on this side of the pond in regard to hardcore from any other place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could see that. I mean, especially it's the they don't look they look like a bunch of people from London. Do you know what I mean? It's like a load of people who it doesn't. It, there's no like coherent aesthetic necessarily. Do you know what I mean? Other than just like people like punks from London doing a thing, it's sick. Like, 
Uh, Graham, so let's say that there, hypothetically, there's like a 22 year old hardcore kid in London. He's been into hardcore a few years, and you're chatting with him, and he says to you, "I don't like knuckle dust." Can you can you respect that kid? <laughs> I'd, I'd, I'd certainly make him explain himself, and and then and then and then he'd learn that he's wrong. <laughs> would you would you be would you be hanging him would you be hanging him off a balcony as he explains himself? <laughs> I'd make him hang himself off a balcony. <laughs> See what I was thinking was Graham just puts on his phone dust to dust and then moshes the kid into the middle of the wheel carriage way. Right? Spin kicks That's some right. sense into it. That's all right. All right, dude. It's your choice. We're kicking this off for the first time. Uh Graham, what is your favorite song off this record? I think for- I mean, like, yeah, Dust to Dust, Two Face Fake, and uh, but also the breakdown and punish is so hard. Um, yeah, choose to ignore. It's a, it's a fucking hard one to pick, really. I guess probably Dust to Dust, um, just because it's such a classic and it's just like, yeah, I can't help but kick someone in the face when they play it. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, all right, Dan, your call. What's your favorite? Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to go dust to dust, but I'm going to do the Dan San original. I'm going with the return of Into Time Zone. <laughs> so, I, so I get the mosh, the mosh intro, and then I get the song Time's Up. And what I was saying earlier is that the song Time's Up, like the, the guitar player is riding that one line style playing on this song, which gives it that very path of resistancey thing and then uh the uh pierre's vocals on it are just so sick and gruff and like aggressive and but still catchy that's the point we always talk about stuff on the pod where we're like this song is hard as fuck or whatever but there's charisma with the vocals and when there's charisma and catchiness like it any hard as fuck song can be something that you go back to over and over again. And that's what is so achieved on uh, Knuckle Dust, like repeatedly, but especially on this song. Yeah, this is so great The because the chorus is fast, but they're doing gangs on it. So yeah. it's so sick, dude. Okay, this is hard for me, dude, because there's Regression and there's Two-Face Fake, which are both like minute-long songs that are really good. And so... I feel like I should choose one of those because their brevity should be commended. But because it's still there, I got to take choose to ignore. It's so fucking good, dude. Like they do the there's like kind of a slow fade in and then it starts with like a slow bounce on the intro and then it breaks to like a more up tempo bounce on the verse and then it breaks fast for the chorus. And that but you choose to ignore is such like kind of a an unorthodox gang vocal, but it just works so nicely, dude. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then it comes out of it, like into like kind of an earth crisis Tom part and then into like a big palm mute riff and then into like a more beat down. And then, then they're out. Like there's no repeaties on anything. It is so sick. It's like a little mini two minute opus. I fucking love this thing, but it hurts. <laughs> It hurts having Two Face Fake and uh, and Regression left on the table. It's a great choice. I also want to give a shout out to the sample before Ill Vision. Goes around. Comes around. We got what goes around. Bloody comes around. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that your yeah. point of reference is Path of Resistance. Who were like, if you had a diagram of hardcore, they would be the absolute polar opposite of this band. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, with with the things being ingested yeah. definitely <laughs> all right uh dan cooked up maybe one of the hardest ones gotta go in the history of uh anyone in hardcore's brain so basically Let's see here. We are doing a one's got to go on agnostic front victim in pain. It came out in 1984 on rat cage records. Chromags age of quarrel came out in 1986 on profile slash rock hotel killing time. Bright side came out in 1989 on in effect and fourth record. Sick of it all blood, sweat, no tears came out in 1989 on in effect. Uh, Dan one's got to go, which you losing. 
I, I, I hate myself for even coming up with this category because how <laughs> do you put one of these in the in the dustbin of life? Um, for me, Age of Quarrel is is the one that is completely not going anywhere. Actually, <laughs> Age of Quarrel is safe. First off, even though there are some down things where Victim in Pain doesn't really have a down moment. So that's interesting. But the highs on Age of Quarrel for me are the highest of the high. And then I cannot lose Blood, Sweat and No Tears. It is so hard. If you listen, I've already banked uh, Victim in Pain, by the way. Uh, That is also just put there with Age of Quarrel. So then it was coming down between Brightside, which is the the key to where hardcore is going, or and incredible epic songwriting and amazing lyrics and just a brilliant sound, or you've got the way the last gasp of where hardcore had been, but done in the hardest fucking possible way. Listen to G.I. Joe Headstomp. Listen to just the way this record is recorded. Everything about it just says hard. It is hard as fuck. Like, I cannot lose Blood, Sweat, and No Tears. And the best thing about it, it is so hard. It is fast. It is full of aggression. It is that. But there is so much catchiness, so many sing-alongs, and so much charisma I mean, I've got to keep blood, sweat, and no tears, and I've I've weeping as I say this, but I've got to, I've got to say, bright side is the one that's got to go. Well, Dan, you stayed true to your '80s list. So <laughs> when we did the top 100 records of the 1980s, Dan had Chromag's Age of Coral at number six. He had Agnostic Front, Victim and Pain at number eleven. He had Sick of It All, Blood, Sweat, No Tears at number fifteen. And Killing Time Bright Side at number 34. <laughs> so that all uh, checks out. Now, for. Oh, you, were ready, you were ready to fact check. I me know. And be it. Like, well, that's I what was. Was that? Hey, I'll tell, you, I'll, t- I'll tell you what. So these records are all so good. I think you could make arguments for. Here, I guess here's my argument. Actually, listen, Graham, you go first. <laughs> I still need a little more time to talk. If I if I'm sussing this out though, I think I can make the argument for three of these that they might be the best hardcore record of all time. You know, depending on the day. This question just done me in for the like. So it's obviously going back and like a lot of these records are just ingrained into your sort of history in it. I listened to this shit so much when I was young, and then obviously I don't like. I don't regularly listen to them. I went back and listened to the Sick of It All LP and I was just like, fucking hell. I don't remember it sounding this hard. Like, because I mean, there's obviously the seven inch songs on there, but it just sounds like the way it's produced or whatever. It's just so fucking hard. And even like listening to Clobber in Time now, I'm just like, fucking hell. And because I thought it was kind of easy. I thought it was like, yeah, you know what? I just, I'd, I'd swear Sick of It All. That's, and then I listened to it yesterday and I was like, fuck, no, this is actually so good obviously the chromax for me is like that i mean that lp is the sort of uh the base for a lot of stuff you know what i mean it's like the most important records in my life but killing time as a band i think i, I like i love crown of thorns and i love you know like the way that the, the the songwriting in that and also just like how like lyrically it's fucking it's it it it's like feels more advanced or something and just i love the songwriting on it i love the guitar parts it's so like the so, yeah the songs are just so fucking good um and agnostic front i think is that yeah that record is one of the most important hardcore records of all time uh so i think and it just doesn't stop does it yeah like, like you were saying before it's just fucking like a relentless record and has everything that i love about hardcore in it I remember hearing it for the first time and being like, fuck me. So I think I probably, yeah, no, I was, I'd have to get rid of Sick of It All, but only because, only, yeah, only because it, it uh, for me, it just doesn't mean as much to me. I just didn't, I, I like, I didn't listen to the LP that much. I like, I listened to the 7 Inch a lot and I just haven't listened to it for ages. I'll probably go back and change my mind now in about a week. 
But yeah. yeah, I think I've got to stand my ground. Just be like, you know what? Make a decision now. Boom. <laughs> I, I like that you called out how hard it is because you're right. There, there are a lot of the seven inch songs that are on this LP, but this LP sounds harder than the seven inch. Yeah. It's so sick. I love it. It's, I, I got to lose it too. And it hurts because I think right now Sigvidal is like the most underrated hardcore band in the world. Um, not many bands have done like three great LPs like them plus one great seven inch. Like that's insane. Yeah. Like, that yeah. run is so insane. And, and they all hold up so nicely and they kill it live. Like they're the real fucking deal. So it hurts to lose it. But going back to my list, I had AF victim and pain at number one, number one, hardcore record of the eighties and dude, number one, hardcore record of all time. Let's go people. Uh, Cause it also has the best hardcore song of all time. Everyone knows, uh, Dan, you know what it is. What is it? Blind justice into last warning. That's right. A point to the champ. Um, <laughs> okay. Then, uh, yeah. Chrome X age of coral. Y- you can't fuck with it right now. If I am, if I'm looking at these four records and saying, what is the worst song out of all of these four records? There is no fucking doubt what it is. Dan, what is it? I think you're going to say Seekers of the Truth. Yep. A hundred percent. But uh, what do you think? What do you think is the worst out of these four? Out of these four albums? No, what do you think is the worst oh. song off all these four records? Oh, fuck me. Um... <laughs> That's the only one. That's the only bad song, I think. I like it, though. Yeah, I mean, I do I... you? If you're I, do, I do. If, okay, Dan, if you're listening to this record on digital and you have the ability to skip it, how often do you skip that song? Not very often. Uh, half the time? It the song might not the song might not make it to the end because it does go on a bit, <laughs> but the the start of it, I'm just I'm there for the the Bon Scott of it all. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll tell you what I'm I'm skipping malfunction every other time and I'm skipping seekers of the truth nine out of ten times that's I it's you know? kind of a good shout I've, it's, yeah I mean I still like it but I'm with you yeah I get it like when you see them that song like goes live yeah, yeah. so like you get it like they wrote that in a room and it's sick but like on record miss me dude like I mean I, I just don't like it. I never liked it. I had this on tape first and it's just like, God damn it. I got to fast forward this fucking song. And then I miss like half of it's a limit. You know what I mean? It's like totally <laughs> fucked up. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. You can't lose age of coral. Like it's high moments are like some of the greatest pieces of hardcore ever. And then killing time. Like this is the birth of modern hardcore. Yeah. yeah. Right. Like the, the recording is so advanced. It sounds great. And you know, these dudes coming out of breakdown, doing raw deal, and then going from like that raw hardcore sound to getting like this Normandy sound, but not losing like any of the fury. And it is just fucking amazing. Like that song, right? next level. Like that run on the B side of this LP, uh, my reason, no, no uh, my reason, new release backtrack wall of hate, like, God damn. And I know that three of those songs are raw deal songs, but dude, <laughs> Jesus Christ, like no release. That song is so crazy because it has like a chorus musically, like the guitar repeats, but none of the words repeat. It's like, it's hooked in with like a guitar solo. It's so sick. It's like, it's almost like a rap song in that way that it's just like, kind of four verses it just goes it's a dude flowing like through this shit it's fucking brilliant dude and it's like it's just sizzled with like this beautiful guitar um yeah and then coming out of that backtrack wall of hate two of the greatest hardcore songs of all time you know what i mean like what can you do backtrack maybe the best chorus ever in the history of hardcore and then like from that chorus going to like one of the best ever cut out mosh parts ever you can't touch it. And then wall of hate, like this song is written in 88, you know, it's on the raw deal demo, but like, it sounds like it could be 1983. It's like the perfect bridge song of like that 
old New York hardcore molding into the new the new New York hardcore, right? Which would come after Brightside with like Madball, Demise, all these the bands that are like leaning a little more into the hip hop and the bounce. Yeah, like yeah. you have that here, you know. But uh, yeah, I can't lose it. So it hurts because, like I said, I think Sick of It All right now, maybe the most underrated band in like the history of hardcore. You know, like with what they were considered before compared to like kind of the way that a lot of people look at them now. Um, but it's the one I got to lose and it hurts, but at least I got the seven inch still. And I got the two LPs after this. So what's up? Well, all uh, I got to say is that since you got to wax poetic about uh bright side, let's just talk for a second. The way the blood and the sweat comes in with that, <laughs> like, you know, you're in for it. Like, this and then it goes into fucking KRS One is yeah. on this record. Yeah. But Dan, you're ta- you're talking the first couple songs of the record. Like I'm talking oh, no, about no, no, how no. I'm talking about how strong like the the back of the B side of Bright you haven't Side let is. me finish. You haven't <laughs> let me finish. <laughs> but you're starting with like let's talk about this record. How about that first song? Yeah, but I'm saying like it announces itself like recording wise just with that guitar and drum just onslaught it just lets you know what you're in for then you go on to you know i was mentioning clobbering time amazing then push too far with gang vocal like verses it is so sick then you've got friends like you which is one of the catchiest hardest songs ever then then later you get rat pack ultimate sing-along like hard fast song then you get G.I. Joe head stomp. Somebody is literally going to die when that gets played. Then the back end of the record, you've got my life into world full of hate, into my revenge. Three of the catchiest, hardest songs like in a row. Like that is a, you want to talk about the back end of Bright Side being goated? This is there with it. And then this record ends on Injustice System. Yeah, like, but, but lyrically, but you skip three songs, Dan. Disillusion and the deal could go. They could trim a little fat here. Oh, definitely. I mean, you could you could edit it down, especially you know with twenty twenty four attention spans. You know, you could definitely edit it down, but those could still make a brilliant seven inch by themselves. <laughs> That's true. That's tripping. true. And dude, I, I love hardcore. I love so many records, especially from the eighties. This is the 31st best hardcore record of the eighties. Like I'm standing by it. You know what I mean? So there's that. But Hey Dan, how, how about them like having clobbering time and not putting it first? I know it's so weird, but, I think I just realized why they didn't when trying to defend how this song, this LP just starts with the like it just comes at you. They didn't want to repeat the seven inch, right? Cause it starts with clobber in time. Yeah. But dude, I would have, I, I think that it's just undeniable. You just got to fucking start with it. You either do that or you start clobber in time. It starts side B. You know, people are still yeah. listening to shit on vinyl this time. Like, I think Clobber and Time in that two slot is a little, a little weird. Although I will say, I like Clobber and Time into Pay the Price more than I like Clobber and Time into Just Lies. True. Well, maybe they just didn't want KRS to be the first thing you hear when you put the record on, but I think that would have been sick. Yeah, yeah. it would have been sick. What if they opened this LP with GI Joe Head Stomp and, yes. like you say, Clobber and Time is side B? Yep. Start side B. I mean, going, well, let's circle back to the Jonah conversation, right? They should have hired Dan as a producer. That was a brilliant <laughs> move right there. You know? I would have been, I would have been what? You're what, 13. You're wasted on this. Yeah. No, what are you going to do? All right. You know what? For the, for the, for the 185 listeners, I will make a playlist track sequencing of <laughs> blood sweat and no tears for the 185 listeners an alt edit that's right the dan's version that's right okay uh dan final thoughts on the pod well i'm just you know rejoicing in a world where we get another high vis record for real um it's no it's no uh secret that i love the band 
and uh really appreciate you coming on the pod great no, no, thanks so much thanks for having me it's uh fucking i haven't done i've talked this much in a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah graham congratulations on another great lp it's it's very hard to do follow-up records you know and a lot of pressure coming off blending like that was universally loved and yeah, it's just, it's always hard to put yourself out there. So uh, we appreciate it. You you wear your heart on your sleeve lyrically. And we have loved this band since we were exposed to it, you know, and uh, you never let us down. We're always rooting for you. So oh, mate. Uh, thanks so much. You, you are the ones, I said it before, and you like, you bigging this up made a lot of people pay attention. So I proper appreciate it. Like. Yeah. Uh, final thoughts, Graham? Um. Ah, uh, fuck knows. I don't know. It's like hardcore's good, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> yeah, Graham. Where can the people follow your band? Uh, I guess just on Instagram and um, and all that. Maybe like we've got a website. I think HiveIsUK dot com, and Hive is is just the Instagram. So yeah. Hell yeah. Okay, Dan. Where can the people find you? At Southport Instagrammer on Instagram. Hell yeah. Okay, everyone, get at the podcast 185 miles south at gmail.com. I respond to everyone. There's a website, 185 miles south.com. There's a playlist link. Smash that Patreon button to uh, help support the pod. And uh, just know we love you all. We'll talk to you again next Monday on Patreon.